Mr. McCoy back with part two of the Pike River Phantom, as you recall. Charlie was living with his grandpa Will and grandma Lou, as well as his cousin Rachel. A barbecue was planned, and Charlie was worried about the town's reaction to his father, who had spent five years in prison. His father wasn't like the other men, and that was the trouble. He bragged about how strong he was, and he talked about how hard he worked at the high school. The neighbors listened and nodded, but Charlie could tell they were bored. Mr. Gessert and Mr. Mikowski were teachers like Grandpa Will. Mr. Drury sold insurance, and Mr. Koch did something at the glove factory. They probably would have liked a chance to talk about their jobs, too. His father called all the ladies by their first names, even though they were much older than he was, and he hadn't seen them for years. Once he mentioned my five years in the school of hard knocks. That was the worst time of all. Grandma Lou had turned away quickly when he said it, and Charlie had felt his own face grow hot. Even Grandpa Will had looked dismayed. His father had noticed a thing. Grandma and Rachel were preparing for the cookout this year when Charlie and Grandpa got home. His grandmother had cooked a kettle of chili for a change, uh, she said, and the kitchen smelled marvelous. You don't have to set up chairs or carry stuff outside or anything, Rachel said as soon as Charlie came in. I'm going to do it all. He knew she was apologizing for what she'd said earlier. He went back to the car. He and Grandpa lifted the birdbath out of the trunk, and then they strolled around the yard trying to decide where it should go. Did you and Rachel work out your problem? Grandpa asked. He put a hand on Charlie's shoulder. I guess so. I don't know. Charlie didn't want to talk about it. He was still angry with Rachel. He thought they were pretty good friends until she'd made that remark about stealing. It changed things. The quiet of the garden was pierced by a whistle. Hey, look here. Look at what your old man bought, Charlie. John Hawking came around the side of the house carrying a battered guitar case. I pawned mine when we were in Milwaukee, he explained to Grandpa Well, Made up my mind I'd get a second-hand replacement with my first paycheck. He was wide-shouldered, medium tall with Grandma Lou's thick, dark hair and Grandpa Will's light brown eyes. His face shone with excitement. Charlie felt a wave of resentment and disliked himself for it. He acts like a kid, he thought, and then, so what? What's so terrible about acting like a kid? It was only terrible if you'd been hoping for another kind of father. So, have your parents ever done something that embarrassed you? Share your experiences with your fellow listener. John opened the case, took out the guitar, and struck a pose. What'll it be, folks? Gotta practice up before the company comes. Ah, uh, I didn't know you could play the guitar, Grandpa joked. He sounded uneasy. Learned how to... Three years ago, maybe two or three years ago, John said, believe me, I've had plenty of time to practice. Charlie winced. Was his father going to tell the neighbors he'd spent his evenings in prison playing the guitar? Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah, he sang as he strummed. Someone's in the kitchen, I know. There was applause from the kitchen window and they turned to see Grandma Lou and Rachel smiling at them. We'll have some community singing tonight. Grandma called. Good for you, Johnny. John bowed. He even did a couple of soft shoe steps. Charlie turned away. He'd die if his father did that in front of the neighbors. As it turned out, the evening was much worse than anything Charlie could have imagined, and it had nothing to do with his father's guitar. Mrs. Koch started the trouble halfway through supper when she said, Rachel, I hope you're going to try out for Sunbonnet Queen this 4th of July. You'd make a lovely queen. I can just see you up on that float on the parade and handing out the prizes in the park, the way your grandmother did when she was your age. You look like she did then, same long dark hair and beautiful eyes. Charlie nearly choked in a fight of bratwurst. The sunbonnet queen? He'd forgotten that part of his strange conversation with the old woman in the woods. I am going to run for queen, Rachel said calmly. The winner has to be a good citizen of Pike River, and I've done lots and lots of things, she blushed. I mean, Grandma thinks I have a chance. Of course you do, Grandma Lou agreed. You're a good citizen, if ever there was one, dear. 
all those cookies you baked for the Veterans Hospital, all those committees you work on, all the candy you sold for the band. Charlie helped with the candy bars, Rachel said quickly. He sold some this morning. Charlie was still trying to remember what the old woman had said. He forgot for a moment that Rachel didn't believe there was an old woman. You know the lady I told you about, the one who took the candy bar? She said she's the real Sunbonnet Queen. I didn't even know what she was talking about. Rachel's blush deepened. That's stupid, she snapped. The Sunbonnet Queen is always a girl, a young girl. You're just making up a story, and I know why. I am not. Charlie was starting to get angry again. First, Rachel called him a thief, and now she was telling everyone he was a liar. You know what she said? She said, tell Will Hawking hello from the real Sunbonnet Queen. Why didn't you tell us this before? Asked Grandma Lou. Because I forgot, that's why. Rachel was close to tears. You're making it all up because I didn't believe an old woman took the bar without paying for it, and I still don't believe it. So there. Now you're making fun of the contest, just to get even. The Hawkins and their guests looked from Rachel to Charlie, trying to decide what to make of this tempest. Now, children, Grandma Lou murmured. What old lady are you talking about, Charlie? asked Grandpa Will. Charlie groaned to himself. Now he'd done it. Uh, just a woman, he mumbled. I, I was trying to sell her a candy bar, and she... She... She asked me if I was related to Will Hawking because I look like you. And she said to tell you the real Sunbonnet Queen says hello. He's lying, Rachel sniffed. I know he's lying. He ate that candy bar himself. I can't figure out who'd say a thing like that, Charlie. Grandpa was looking at him hard. Uh, where did you say she lives? Outside town, Charlie said, wishing he had never started this. Uh, there's that bridge over Pike River, and beyond that, there's a woods. He paused, aware that they were listening and watching him curiously. I went back through the woods, and I saw this old house sitting by itself in the middle of a clearing, and I talked to the old woman who lives there. And that's all. Mr. Mikowski cleared his throat. Sounds like the Delaney place. Some cousins inherited it from the old folks and rented it out for a while, but it's been abandoned for years. The cousins moved to Detroit, I think. They never could sell it. Certainly an old lady wouldn't be living out there in the woods by herself, Charlie, Mrs. Cott said. You must be mistaken, dear. Charlie looked around the patio. It wasn't too dark to see the doubting expressions on every face. They all believed Rachel when she said he was making up a story. Every last one of them thought he was a liar. It was Grandma Lou's reaction that hurt most. Her voice trembled when she spoke. No one has been in the Delaney house for years, she said. We all know that. You'd better stop this silly talk right now, Charlie. We don't want to hear any more of it. Charlie jumped up and started toward the house. He's John Hawking's boy, all right, making up a crazy story just to get attention. That's what the neighbors were thinking. But it was much worse knowing his grandmother agreed with them. Come on back, Charlie. Grandpa Will called. You haven't finished your supper. Let's forget the whole thing. I'm not hungry. Hey, kid, you can't leave now, John shouted. You don't want to miss the singing, do you? The singing. His father hadn't even heard what was happening. All he cared about was his guitar. Yeah, I want to miss the singing, Charlie growled. He let the breezeway door slam hard behind him. So what do you make of the reactions that everyone had toward this old woman out of the Delaney place? Share your opinion with your fellow listener. Saturday night had been bad enough. Sunday morning was worse with everyone except Rachel being super polite to Charlie and not mentioning what had happened the night before. But it wasn't until Sunday afternoon that Charlie decided to leave Pike River. He and Grandpa Will were out in the garden digging a shallow hole for the base of the bird bat. We'll pick up a few flagstones later to set around it, Grandpa said. That'll look spiffy. Then he changed the subject so abruptly that Charlie knew he'd been waiting for the chance to say what he wanted to say. I took a few minutes to run out to the Delaney place this morning, Charlie. Thought I'd find out whether vagrants had broken in. Not that it's any of my business, I guess, but... 
If it were my house, I'd appreciate someone checking in every once in a while. You never know when some member of the Delaney family might show up, try to sell it again, or even want to get it in shape to move in. Vagrants can wreck a place in a hurry. He was talking fast and didn't look up from his digging. Charlie shifted the birdbath closer to the hole. Did you see her? No, I didn't. There wasn't anyone there, and frankly, I don't think there's been anyone there for years. The front and back doors were locked up tight. I looked through the windows that were low enough, and I didn't see any signs of life. Maybe she was upstairs, Charlie said stubbornly. Maybe she was taking a nap. Old ladies take naps. I don't think so. Grandpa Will picked up the bird bath and set it firmly in the hole. He stamped the earth around the base. It didn't feel like anyone was there, Charlie. It felt like an empty house, and I believe that's what it was. Then you think I made up the old lady, Charlie said. You think I ate that darned candy bar the way Rachel said I did. Why don't you just say it right out? I think you're a fine boy, he said slowly. I don't know what you saw or what you think you saw. Maybe we aren't even talking about the same house, though I don't know what other one it could be. The point is, he stepped back and looked Charlie squarely in the eye. You have to be careful with the truth. You're old enough to know what's real and what's make-believe. Now, I don't know what the argument is between you and Rachel. Sure you do, Charlie interrupted, and his voice cracked. You're on her side. You believe her, not me. His grandfather looked unhappy. Rachel is your cousin and your friend, he said firmly. We aren't against you, Charlie, but people are going to judge you on how you handle the facts. It's always better to, I told you the facts. I went to that house and I talked to the lady who lives there. She took a candy bar and she didn't pay for it. He stomped on the loose dirt on his side of the bird bath. Nobody would think I was lying if I was anybody else's kid. Now, wait one minute. The words were spoken quietly, but Charlie knew Grandpa Will was furious. Your father's a good man. Your grandmother and I are proud of him because he's paid for his mistake, and now he's ready to start over. He's enthusiastic, and he isn't afraid to work hard. You ought to be proud of him, too. Charlie picked up a stone and pegged it across the yard. He walked out on me, he said. I mean, nobody made him hold up that store. If he hadn't done that, he wouldn't have gone to prison. I wouldn't have had to stay with Aunt Laura all that time. Now listen to me, young man. Grandpa was struggling to control his anger. Your dad had a terrible time for a few years. First your mother died, then he lost his job and couldn't keep up on the payments on your house. And then he began drinking. Grandpa rubbed his chin. I'm not making excuses for him, Charlie. I'm just telling you how it was. You hardly know him, I guess. You've been living together for a few months. That's not long enough to really know someone. Charlie didn't want to hear any of this. He and Grandpa Will had become pals in the last two weeks. Charlie had even pretended secretly that Grandpa was his real father and John Hawking was just someone who was living with them for a while. Now it was all spoiled. Guitar chords floated from the den's open window, settling into a barely recognizable version of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Grandpa squeezed Charlie's shoulder. We can talk again later, right? Right, Charlie said, but he didn't mean it. He decided by then what he was going to do. He'd run away. He had money, $57 in his Model T car bank uh, that he'd last counted. $57 would take him a long way. Where would he go? He thought first of returning to Milwaukee to Aunt Laura, but he didn't really want to do that. Aunt Laura had tried to make him feel welcome, but Charlie had always known he was in the way. Besides, Aunt Laura's apartment was the first place where the family would look for him. It would be better to go where no one knew him. California, maybe. He could mow lawns or collect aluminum cans to make money. And if he didn't earn much, it wouldn't matter. He could live on the beach, he could catch fish to eat, look for rare shells every morning. Some kinds of shells were worth lots of money. Uh, he'd do all right in California because there wouldn't be anyone to remind him that he was John Hawking's son. And he'd be better, and he'd be careful about how he handled facts. But there was one piece of unfinished business he had to take care of first. A couple of 
nights later, the sounds of his father's guitar's background, Charlie planned a return visit to the house in the woods. He had to go back. He had to prove to his family, especially to Grandpa Will, that he wasn't lying. He would have to ask the woman in the house to let him snap her picture. The memory of his grandfather's sharp words was as painful as a throbbing tooth. The next morning, as Charlie walked along the edge of the highway, he pretended that this was the day he was leaving Pike River. This was the last time he'd crossed the Pike River Bridge, the last time he'd see all these pink and yellow and purple wildflowers blazing in the sun. Any minute now, a car would slow down the awful ride and he'd be on his way. He was thinking so hard that he almost bumped into the mailbox that marked the beginning of the road to the clearing. He looked at the side of the rusted box to make sure that the letters were D-E-L on the bottom. Well, maybe Delaney was the name of the woman who was living in the house now. Maybe she was a daughter or a cousin of the original owners and had decided she wanted to stay there. Grandpa Will himself had said that the Delaney's might come back someday. Charlie walked swiftly through the woods to the sunny open space beyond. The path to the front porch was longer than he remembered and laced with prickly weeds. Empty windows stared at him as he approached. In spite of himself, Charlie thought of Grandpa's comment. It felt like an empty house, and I believe that's what it is. He lifted the bulldog knocker, let it thunk against the door, there was no answer. He knocked again, with his fist this time, and then, astonished at his own boldness, he tried the knob. The door swung open, squeaking loudly. So what do you think Charlie will see? Share with your fellow listener. And now, milliseconds more of the Pike River Phantom. The front and back doors were locked, Grandpa had said. Well, the front door was open now. Didn't that prove someone was here? Hello? Still, no answer. Charlie wondered what to do next. He didn't have any right to be in the house, but what if the old lady was sick or had fallen and needed help? She was mean and she said strange things, but he couldn't just walk away. Besides, if she were gone, he still wanted to find some proof that she'd been here a couple of days ago. We'll find out what Charlie discovers and so much more as the Pike River Phantom continues.